Bill Morgan, president of Parker University. And with me today is Dr. Katie Pullman. She's the director of research at Parker University. Katie, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me here. You're also the, the uh, researcher of the year in the I, United States. I was, I was. Quite an honor. So we're here to discuss a kind of important topic. We, our nation's in crisis, the world's in crisis. Uh, the, coronavi the coronavirus outbreak has got a lot of people scared and they're looking for mm -hmm. answers. And it's affecting a lot of chiropractors. We have some great concerns of what messages we should get out. And uh, we just like to have a real pragmatic discussion about what's going on and what our messages should be. One of the, one of the things that was a catalyst for getting us together today was there's the uh, WFC released a, a statement to the world about what they recommended chiropractors do. And it had a lot of really uh, pertinent things in there about hand washing and sanitation and communicate your patients. And they had one point that basically said chiropractors should not claim to have some type of cure for this disease and they should not be advertising that on social media. And it was strongly worded and, and I actually contacted the WFC and I said, this is kind of strongly worded, this is pretty harsh. And they said, well, actually, the government agencies, or a lot of them, are cracking down on fat, false advertisements. And there's some people out there claiming that if you get your chiropractic adjustment, you don't have anything to worry about with that virus. That it, it actually not just in, improves your immune system, but it'll give you protection. And he's, he is who I, the person I talked to. He said, can you imagine an elderly person who's concerned about their immunity getting on, on rapid transit, mass transit, going to the chiropractor, with the belief that they're going to be get a degree of immunity by getting that adjustment. And I, I didn't think that was so, but actually I went on the, online and I actually saw some pretty bizarre claims yeah. of, of saving your patient's lives. You know, if, you come in, if they come in to get adjusted, it'll, they'll, they'll be saved from the coronavirus. I literally saw that today. So I can see the, uh, the tone there. But also, um, we are going to be held accountable after this crisis passed for the things we've said. Um, the Texas Chiropractic Board of Examiners, or Texas Board of Chiropractic Examiners, just sent this out. All licensees are advised that anyone making claims that adjustments can provide immunity to the flu or coronavirus is likely in violation of statute and rule relating to both scope of practice and advertising claims. Also, um, we would be held accountable by the Federal Trade Commission for false advertisement if we said right. things like that. Right. So can you imagine if you're treating someone, you made these claims, and, and uh, God forbid that patient died. Yep. That would be pretty hard to defend, and it would. And frankly, we're already being you know contacted by the media about chiropractors claiming to cure this condition. So it's you know we're we're not talking to the media right now, but it's going to break in the news pretty quick, and we got to be careful how we message this. One of the things the uh, the FCA or the uh, WFC um, state, state, uh, paper said was there's no credible evidence or c credible data that chiropractic adjustments has a, lends protection to the coronavirus. Yeah, and I've been communicating with people as well to try to share that message. And I know that's a hard one because we were trained differently, but what's important is our understanding of what evidence means. And empirical evidence needs to be on the evidence hierarchy and the evidence that we do have or the data that we do have that when when I when I've said there's no credible evidence and when WFC released their statement of no credible evidence people come back and there are studies out there mm -hmm. but that it doesn't equate to having evidence that can impact our clinical practice and our patients and so all of the studies that are out there right now are either on the basic science and so done in animal models um, and basic science you need to translate that into clinical um, the clinical environment that hasn't been done and the other studies that have been done in humans are only done on um, on a few patients so case reports so at the bot on a hierarchy scale it's at the bottom of those so it has a high chance for bias in the studies we need the bottom <laughs> we need the bottom data we just have to really understand what that means, it's not at the top level, we can't have, uh, it's not part of clinical practice guidelines as our low back pain is. We are still, when it comes to immunity, at the bottom bottom layer, Just, just it's still just theory. I know one study that, that people um, quote a lot is the Brennan et al., which was published in JMPT in 1991. It was um, done. What year is that? 
1991. Okay, it's a couple years ago. It was, and that's one of the flags we need to have as um, somebody who wants to uh, quote credible research is to look at the year and kind of wonder, okay, this was done back then, why hasn't more investigations gone on? So there has to be something to that. But the paper was done and people quote that and that there was an immediate change. One, they were healthy um, chiropractic students and there was no um, follow-up long-term. So we might have changed data in a small group of healthy individuals, but we don't know what that does in sick and we still don't have any data of long-term effect. And so well, that's where we're at with the data. And we also know that this perturbation stimulates your immune system. Correct. So uh, we need to have longer studies. Now you and I participated in the largest chiropractic study ever conducted over a period of many years. <laughs> um, and we understand, you know, scientific rigor is very hard. You, you just can't have a study with 17 people and you follow somebody for 15 minutes. Yep. We follow people, you know, it, it, it really, to, to get that higher level of where you can actually say, no, this is pretty, it's pretty strongly supported or even moderately supported. Um, it takes a lot of rigor. And historically, the government and most of the uh, agencies will fund research in back pain. And I know back pain is not as sexy as, as all the other things people like to treat in chiropractic, but that we have strong research there because that's where the money is. Um, how can we stimulate more interest in, in, in immune response or studying immune response in chiropractic? How, how can we get the monies for that? That's a great question. Money um, is one is one point of that. It's also having the uh, the the capacity, um, and it's not our chiropractic degree is fantastic. It makes us fantastic clinicians, but we need to have the additional training. And so, we, as a community, we need to be support, supporting. Um, and even if somebody doesn't have a chiropractic degree, somebody's interested in studying the effect of chiropractic care on immunological um, effect on uh, after chiropractic care. We need to be able to fund them to get their higher education. Uh, as well as, and then funding the studies, uh, so the study, and, it, and, and I say studies, mm -hmm. because it isn't just one. And that's the thing with back pain, um, the, the study that we did was on top of others and on top of others, but now we're finally part of clinical practice mm -hmm. guidelines, but it took years of many studies, so you, people can't quote just one study. And it only to others, because if we show in the back and neck pain studies that it's safety, then we can go to the next level. Well, if it's safe, what else can it do? We have like 45 studies going on right we do, now. We do. So we're, we're pretty rigorous in this. We like to, to see, uh, see this out. Um, on, on the internet, there's people citing like 10 studies that are mm -hmm. out there. And they're saying these prove there's credible evidence. Is that so? It's not. And it breaks my heart to what, say that. Well, you and I are chiropractors. Mm -hmm. If I could adjust someone and empirically say, I can cure coronavirus. I would be shouting it from the rooftops. You and I both. I would quit my job and go back into practice. We'd love that, mm -hmm. but we also are responsible. And we are being accused of deceptive advertising right now as a profession, and there'll be ramifications. We'll pay for that for years to come. We're going to lose trust and credibility in the field, and I don't see a problem with us sharing that we don't have credible evidence to support this. We might have clinical experience, patients might want this, all of those are important and to be able to say to your patients like you're coming to me but just know that where we're at data wise isn't supporting this and I think that's the confidence and the clarity that we need to Yeah, we sharing. need to have trust and I get adjusted on a regular basis and we, if you've been in practice for any length of time, you've seen people respond to that in ways you, that science can't explain. Now what we're also not saying is it doesn't help, Correct. we just haven't researched it enough. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to ask that question. We, if, if we can't get money from the government to fund this, we may need chiropractors to pitch in and help us with this, this type of research. But as, as it stands right now, we, are not, we really can't say that we have str any type of strength in our, in our evidence. There is no credible evidence. No credible, that's pretty it's, strong. It's... So the message I would recommend that the doctors in the field sit to Right now, this, so if you go out there and you say, you know, this will boost your immune system or this is going to provide protection, you could be under the hand of the law at that point. But what you could recommend to your patients, and I highly recommend this, is to tell your patients if you've got a condition that can be helped by chiropractic, you should stay away from emergency rooms. You should stay away from urgent care facilities. You probably should stay away from the medical doc office. If you've got something that can be treated by the chiropractor, you should come to my office and be treated and avoid that Petri dish that, that in there. That's a way we can help save our patients. And the medical doctors right now are just inundated. They are buried. 
they would probably love to send you yes, some of their yes. musculoskeletal and other conditions. Um, and at a time like this, I think most people wouldn't mind, you know, even, even people who, are, who uh, mainly treat visceral conditions or just subluxations, I think they would appreciate getting even some, uh, some musculoskeletal conditions into practice right now, too. Absolutely. It's such a great opportunity that we have to offer um, the healthcare community to be a part of the solution. Katie, I had the opportunity to, to know Joe Keating when he was here on Earth. And he had a quote that I love citing. It says, all professions use unproven methods, but what's unethical is to make unsubstantiated claims about those methods. So I think that's where we're at now. We're, we, we, we're making claims that we can't back. We're making claims based upon our beliefs, our philosophy, and, but to say that they're scientifically backed, we really shouldn't be doing this. Yep, yep, we need to be able to discern quality, of, quality and level of evidence. Something, something that's interesting that came out, you, the, the uh, uh, WHO's guidelines today, is that we shouldn't use ibuprofen to treat coronavirus. That means people around the, the country who've relied on ibuprofen for pain relief are probably going to stop taking it. So if they are somebody who's subject to pain, they're going to be looking for other answers. I think that's an opportunity where we could probably reach out to those people who've been habitual pill poppers and get them into our office for, for some relief. Absolutely, and following the WFC recommendations of disinfecting the, oh my the tables, goodness. keeping our hands clean, and washing, doing all those things, we can offer a lot of great help at this time. So I have another question. So there's a lot of memes going out there on the on the uh, on the internet right now. One of them is showing that the chiropractors who treated uh, you know 6,000 patients during the the uh, the flu epidemic of 1918 basically had very few or no deaths, where people who weren't getting chiropractic care did have deaths, and that's, that's just going all over the place. Can you speak to that? I can. What a beautiful meme it is. But the problem is it is, it is just a meme and it is just a news report. There is no scientific paper that backs that up. And so what that means is that nobody can check the validity, the reliability, the quality of that study. Mm -hmm. It is just numbers. It's wonderful if they were true, but it's it's essentially clinical, potentially clinical experience, ex experience and that's all we can say it, say it is. I wish we had pa the paper to back that up. That would have been incredible. Here's but. an inter interesting story. I, my, one of my CAs when I was in private practice, and I'm going to tell you how old I am, she was alive during the 1918 epidemic, and she talked about how it was. Nobody came out of their houses. The mm -hmm. doctors would, would, if they were going to leave medicine, would leave it at the end of the driveway. They didn't want to even enter. But it was pretty much like we're probably going to experience over the next couple of weeks that they, everybody self-quarantined. Um, Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. We're, I'm, we're so blessed to have you at Parker. It was a pleasure. Thank you.